Well, we have heard the news of the tragic end of the Titan submersible. It was a fruit or a product of what is called extreme tourism. What was supposed to be an enjoyable trip resulted in disaster. And according to experts, the reason behind it was perhaps because it failed to consider the real concerns. There was much optimism on the part of the company uh, making the, this submersible, and but they failed to consider real concerns or the reality of the dangers. And it is said that standards perhaps were violated, uh, were not considered in terms of the material, the structure, or even the safety. And we, we condone with those the families of those who died in this tragic incident. And this is man desiring to venture into the deep parts of the ocean for whatever reason, for discovery perhaps, or for leisure. And yet this tells us of man in himself as, as uh, perhaps limited, unable to look into the various issues and concerns of his life, and it, this is a product of man's continuing struggle with sin. This is how man, in his very nature, limited, is bound to fail without considering or without seeking the wisdom of God. And this is what we will be continu continuing in our study as we look into this uh, Old Testament book or the book of Leviticus. Uh, we know that uh, per, for many, it might find uh, it might be a confusing and irrelevant book at that because of the various laws that we have been studying or one is studying or looking into but it is said that it is of great importance if we want to know the rest of the old testament and even the new testament a good foundation will help us discern or understand the wisdom of god for his people especially for the lost and for his people, his believers, in various situations of life and in all generations. And it is considered to be the central book of the Pentateuch. It is like when you go up the mountain, it is the, when you reach the top of the mountain, that, that is what Leviticus is all about. And it is part of the narrative of God's people as they journey from Egypt towards the promised land. And we have been saying that God promised to dwell with his people. This is what he said in Exodus 25 and 29. He promised to be with his people as they journey towards the promised land. And uh, when we could look into the, the book of Exodus, towards the end of it, we see a problem. Because when Moses was... Uh, instructed by God to construct the tabernacle wherein the, the promised presence of God will be uh, seen and manifested as he reaches out or as he communes with his people, we see the cloud or the presence of God descending and Moses unable to enter the tabernacle. As we have said, it, is, it was a crisis of sort or there was a tension because how can God commune with his people if no one can enter the tabernacle? And that is why Leviticus provides the answer of for how, ma how man can enter into the presence of God through the sacrifices and the laws that he will be giving to his people, the nation of Israel, so that they will enjoy the privilege of continuing fellowship with God as they journey towards the promised land. And so the tabernacle was a sort of a mobile, portable Sinai in the midst of God's people. And initially, we, have, we had been looking, or we had looked into the first three sacrifices, which were basically voluntary sacrifices. And we considered uh, the first one, the burnt offering. It was for the atonement and consecration of God's people. And then we look into the second, the grain offering, for the dedication of God's people before God himself. And thirdly, we look into the meal offering or the communion offering. 
It was meant for God to commune with His people. And so we find here a logical sequence of how God's people worship in the Old Testament. When one is cleansed, now he is he dedicates himself to his God and ultimately there will be that communion or that fellowship that God desires for his people. So we see here a sequence. But of course, everything doesn't go on as, as planned. There will be interruptions of that communion. And so the next offering, uh, what we call the sin offering or purification offering is what the people of God will do. And this we find in Leviticus 4, chapter 1 until chapter 5, verse 13. So let me invite you to once again look into this uh, chap uh, the scriptures, Leviticus 4, chapter 1 to 5 and verse 13. We will not be reading the whole uh, portion of scriptures. We will just be reading the first 12 and we will jump into verses 22 and 26 as we end the reading of God's word. This is how the word of God says. Leviticus 4 verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done, and thus any one of them, it is the appointed anointed priest who sins, if it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, then he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. He shall bring the bull at the, to the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord and lay his hand on the head of the bull and kill the bull before the Lord. And the anointed priest shall take some of the bull, blood of the bull, and bring it into the tent of meeting. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle part of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense before the Lord that is in the tent of meeting. And all the rest of the blood of the bull he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And all the fat of the bull of the slain of the sin offering, he shall remove from it the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. Just as these are taken from the, from the ox of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, and the priest shall burn them, on the altar of the burnt offering, but the skin of the bull and all the, its flesh with its head, its legs, its entrails, and its dung, all the rest of the bull, he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place to the ash heap, and shall burn it up on a fire of wood. On the ash heap it shall be burned. Now verses 13 to 21 will speak of the same manner of offering in this, but this time, relating to the whole congregations. So let's jump to 22. When a leader sins, doing unintentionally any one of all the things that by the commandments of the Lord, his God ought not to be done and realizes his guilt or the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring as his offering a goat, a male without blemish, and he shall lay his hand on the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out the rest of its blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering. And all its fat he shall burn on the altar like the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings. So the priest shall make atonement for him, for his sin, and he shall be forgiven. And again, the succeeding verses will speak of the same, but this is for the common people. Now, this fourth offering is called the sin offering, or by many, purif purification offering. And 
Like what I've said a while ago, sin disrupts good relations. And thus communion and fellowship is broken. This was the last sacrifice we discussed or we look into. And this is what happens in our relationship with our God because of the reality of remaining sin. And so here, God provides for a sacrifice for Israel in order to maintain fellowship with Him. And so, how can God's people maintain that relationship with God? It is only possible by the, by the restoring grace of God. And so, this is my message for us this morning. A sinner who seeks forgiveness is assured of God's restoring grace based on Christ's purifying or atoning sacrifice. A sinner who seeks forgiveness is assured of God's restoring grace based on Christ's purifying or atoning sacrifice. Ang makasalanan na humihingi ng kapatawaran ay nakakatiyak ng nagpapanumbalik na biyaya ng Diyos batay sa nagpapa, uh, nagpapadalisay na sakripisyo ng Panginoong Jesus o ni Kristo. And so here in this offering, we see here at the fore the subject of sin. That's why it is called sin offering. And sins need to be purified. And here the details about sin its effect and how a way back to God is made possible. And this uh, offering tells us two important truths about sin and the hope be, uh, one has because of sin. Two things we will look into. First, the awfulness of remaining sin. Ang kakilakilabot na natitirang kasalanan. And secondly, the availability of restoring grace, ang pagkakaroon ng mapbiyayang nagpapanumbalik. These are the two things that we see clearly from this offering or from the sacrifice that the people of God are instructed to do. And this sacrifice is a compulsory or mandatory thing as the occasion warrants. Firstly, let us look into the, uh, the awfulness of remaining sin. Now, in verse 1 and 2, it provides the introduction of the offering. And we are told of this, the reason for the offering is because of sins unintentional. Now, the word for sin is hatha in Hebrew, which means to miss the mark. And that is why this is called hatat or, or, or sin offering because of the idea of sin itself. But this, this offering is more than, more than just cleansing for the sin uh, because it is basically the cleansing of the things, especially in the temple, that is uh, defined as a result of human sin. Another word we need to consider is the word unintentional. The word conveys to wander off like a ship who wanders away. It is used for sins which do not come from willful act of rebellion or defiance against God. Rather, is these are sins resulting from weakness, failure in our daily living. It is like when we say, I didn't know that, or I didn't mean it. These are the expressions we have when we commit sin, which are unknowingly, done or out of carelessness. It can be out of carelessness, ignorance, perhaps neglect or failure. And so it needs to be confessed and atoned for. But also, there are what we call the effects of sin that needs to be cleansed. So what does this teach us? A believer needs to confront the reality of remaining sin brought about by the effect of original sin. Kailangang harapin ng isang mananampalataya ang katotohanan ng natitirang kasalanan dulot ng epekto ng original na pagkakasala o kasalanan natin. According to the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, it says 
from the original corruption whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good and wholly inclined to all evil, do proceed all actual transgressions, all possession of original sin. It tells us that we are, are being sinful because of Adam or its root on him and origin produces our personal and actual sins. We sin because we are sinners. And conversion does not eradicate the presence of sin though we have de been delivered from its dominion. This is what we know. This is the reality of our condition. If you are a believer, you have been uh, brought, out, brought out from the dominion of sin, but there is still the reality of remaining sin in us. But let us look into this offering. There are some interesting observations that we can find. The animal sacrifice varied based on position, guilt, or economic condition. In chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, which we did not read, there, there we find examples of unintentional sins. There are at least four listed there. And we can categorize them into legal violations or religious. Uh, perhaps when we speak of legal violation, it can be our failure to pay our tax return accordingly. And when we speak of religious violations, this may be ritual issues. And so it was impossible not to sin against God's demand for his people. Somebody said, it is impossible for God to deny his inherent holiness and humans to escape inherent sinfulness. And this is the reality of our condition. Even as believers, everyone stands guilty of sin and defilement. God provided reconciliation to him through the sacrifice. The innocent animal foreshadowed the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what we are told in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. For our sake, he made, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so we might become the righteousness of God. And this is what the animal foreshadowed. Christ suffering at the cross for whom? So that we might be reconciled with him through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in, as we look into the sacrifice itself, the ritual itself, the order in the steps of the ritual conveys us an important message spiritually. Why did the priest start at the altar of burnt offering where he slew the animal? and entered the tent with blood, wherein when he enters the tent or the tabernacle, there are two portions, the holy, the holy and holy of holies. And when the priest enter, he will sprinkle the blood seven times before the curtain, entering into the holy of holies. And after which, he will put blood on the horns of the altar of incense. But after that, the ritual doesn't end. He will uh, exit and return to the altar of burnt offering to complete the butchering of the animal. The fat will be burned and, and uh, the remaining parts of the carcass delivered outside the camp and burned up. So this movement symbolizes the staggering effects of sin in God's eyes and the drastic steps necessary necessary for the sin to be removed from God's presence. And so here, like what we have read earlier, for the priest, sin polluted his inter intercessory work inside the tent. Thus, it needed to be cleansed. But sacrifice of an animal, according to this, to this uh, ritual only purge corruption of the outer person or the body because the corruption of human sin polluted the tent and it did cleansing the animal can only purge uh, 
the outer body according to Hebrews 9 verses 13 and 14. And so the inner person needed purging for his own soul. And it is only possible through Christ. Unlike the anointed, anointed priest who sinned and brought forth his offering, our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews 4.15, he who was tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. In other words, Christ that brought forth both forgiveness and cleansing as well, thus we have this continuing access to God. It was because of Christ's death that the continuing access of God's people are assured despite the, their sin before him. It is said that one of the most or the most deadliest animal or snake is the Australian inland taipan. And the venom of one bite can kill 100 adult humans. That is, this is how deadly this snake is. But we have a far more dangerous venom in our hearts. Sadly, many try to play with it rather than put it to death. And so the challenge for us is beware. Beware of sin's corrupting effect. For it does not stagnate, but progresses if not dealt with. Mag-ingat sa masamang epekto ng kasalanan dahil ito ay hindi tumitigil. Ngunit lumalala, nadar, lumalawak kung ito ay hindi haharapin. A wrong understanding of personal sins places one in great danger and harm. And there are many ways to classify personal sins. And perhaps one which we have known and a serious error at that is the Roman Catholic view of human or personal sin. And that is why they classify it into venial sins and mortal sins. Venial from the, from the Latin word venia, meaning forgiveness, and they think of it as less serious. Perhaps it is because of ignorance. And so, if one dies, perhaps the sin will be expiated through cleansing in purgatory. That is the hope of a Roman Catholic who dies with sin. And the other one is mortal sin. They say that new sanctification through sacraments is necessary to escape damnation in hell. But we need to be reminded of the reality of sin. But all sins are mortal in consequence. This is what James tells us in James 1 and verse 15. Sin fully grown bring forth death. So we cannot just uh, do away, tinker with sin. It is a danger for the human soul. But what we read a while ago with this uh, offering is that it is uh, the author of Leviticus is telling us of how we ought or how God wants us to deal with these sins which is called unintentional sins. This is a category of sin according to knowledge. This is what the Jews teach or the, the Word of God teaches. Uh, categorized into unintentional sins and presumptuous sins. And what are presumptuous sins? These are had high-handed sins which is defiant against God. This is what we find in Numbers 15 and verse 30 wherein it says there, when one reproaches God, he shall be cut off because a high-handed uh, sin defies the holiness of God, it is seen against the full knowledge or full light of knowledge and conscience. And it is expressed by the raising of the hand in defiance or perhaps the middle finger against God. This is how man expresses his defiance against God. But here we are told of the unintentional sins. And unintentional sins demands atonement 
for a cleansing. But let me remind you that we need to distinguish unintentional sin from the willful ignorance as stated in 2 Peter 3 and verse 5. For they willfully forget or deliberately overlook God's truth. And that is why when we study the book of Numbers, we found there the cities of refuge, which was instructed by God for the nation of Israel. For when one uh, commits an accidental killing, he can run to that cities, cities of refuge in order for him to be protected from the vendetta, in order for him to escape death because it was unintentional in the first place. But how, how should we approach or deal with these sins? In our time, sin has become a right for many people. It has progressed to that direction. And in the LGBTQ plus movement, they defy the defiance of God's created order or failing to look into the creation reality creates compounding issues, not only moral, but practical. And that is why countries, especially in the United States, are having problems with this issue. Because now, for those belonging to this movement, they, they uh, press on with their own right in government, in, uh, in the workplace, in various areas. Another problem we see is the problem of abortion. Abortion issues have compounding effects on population. In manpower, in the workforce, even in government budget, because government itself condones such practice because now sin left unchecked unrepented but now becomes a right of the individual and that is why we need to be reminded that individual sin sins affect others it affects the church the community the society because sin is never alone that's why sin caused by leaders of the church have effect upon the work of God. Member sin affect the church, the work of the gospel. Even it's the, it, it creates stumbling of others. And that is why we need to be watchful of sins because we need to be dealing with sin rather than taking it, brushing it aside. And perhaps one theologian, uh, the Puritan, John Owen, reminds or teaches us how to deal with the sin or our sins as human beings. In his book, Mortification of Sin, which is actually an exposition of Romans 8 verse 13, which says, live according to the flesh, you will, you will uh, live according to the flesh, you will die. But by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so what is John Owen teaching us here? Though Christian can't eliminate sin in this life, Owen encourages us to diligently fight sinful desires and put them to death. And we are reminded of, his fa of this favorite quote of John Owen, Be killing sin or sin will kill you. And that is how we, as believers, should take sin seriously in our life. But secondly, the availability of restoring grace. Ang pagkakaroon ng biyayang nagpapanumbalik. In several verses, verse 13, 22, and 25, and even in chapter 5, we find there the status or degree of guilt Meaning, one person offers the sacrifice after realizing the guilt. And this pushes the worshiper to offer this offering. Knowing his sin brings him before God to bring this offering. But we, don't, we are not told in the verses, it is unclear how guilt came about. Perhaps somebody told him or he, he may have read from scriptures and he knew the guilt that he had before God. 
But when we speak of guilt, this is not a subjective feeling. But rather, it is an objective reality. Knowing one has sinned against God. This is what we find in, in the story of King Josiah in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23. When he knew of the sins of the nation of Israel upon reading the word of God for the first time, he was brought into repentance and lead the nation of Israel back to God. And so, what happened? What happened here when one offers the sacrifice? After the observance of the ritual, there was, a, we find here a refrain mentioned, which brings assurance of the results to a believer. This we find in verses 20, 25, 31, and 35, and in chapter 5 as well. And what is the refrain? The sin shall be forgiven. And this is a wonderful assurance of one drawing near to God in repentance. There is the assurance of forgiveness of one's sin. And so it teaches us that God's restoring grace is brought forth by conviction of sin, leading to radical repentance and mortification. Ang biyayang nagpapanumbalik ng Diyos ay nararanasan o nakakamtan sa pamamagitan ng conviction ng kasalanan na humahantong sa pagsisisi at sa pagpuksa ng kasalanan. This is what happens when the grace of God uh, visits a sinner. He is brought to the conviction of his sin, leading to a radical repentance and thus mortifies or kills this sin. It is important to underscore that the ritual alone did not clean, cleanse sin. Forgiveness came with the acknowledgement of and remorse for sin. The bringing of the offering before God was an expression of faith in God's willingness to forgive and restore the sinner who willingly comes before Him in a repentant heart. In other words, it was an act of faith in exercise, exercise in obedience to the Word of God by performing the purification ritual the priest makes atonement for the guilty worshiper blood sacrifice was necessary to provide cleansing forgiveness purification of the sin committed by the guilty and the sin committed by the guilty person is forgiven but it also indicates more than just pardon and forgiveness there is now what we call the renewal of covenant relations through reconciliation. And so the sanctuary has been purified and the access to God has been restored. Remember, when we have strained, strained relations because of whatever fault one or both had, when, there is, when one is forgiven or one forgives one another, there is now a happy reconciliation because of the repentance brought about by those conflicting parties. Blood was the effectual agent for the purification, interceding to God in behalf of the guilty. And so the outcome was complete restoration of the relationship between God and the sinner worshiper. This is what happens through this sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22 tells us the shedding of the blood was the only way to appease against the offenses against God's holiness. And the result of, purific of the purification offering is that the people are forgiven. Again, Hebrews 13 verse 12 tells us, Jesus suffered outside the gate to sanctify us by His blood. Because we have been made impure by sin, we need not only forgiveness, but cleansing in order to to make us godly and holy. But let us be reminded that this ritual was a symbolic act. Forgiveness was a gift from God. It is act of God's free grace. 
when a sinner draws near to God in repentance. In other words, the priest mediated forgiveness but not provided it. Perhaps many of us are familiar with the process of sugar coating, especially in the medicine. And it, when it is sugar coated, it looks and perhaps tastes good initially. But it hides the unsavory taste. But the healing of the healing effect of the medicine. Grace coats the covering of the power of sin for sinners' good. Bringing the sinner to, rip, to conviction of his sin brought into repentance. And so the challenge for us is be amazed by the power of God's restoring grace to overturn sin in a repentant sinner. Mamangha sa kapangyarihan na nagpapanumbalik na biyaya ng Diyos na i na ibagsak ang kasalanan sa nagsisising makasalanan. Perhaps a very familiar quote for us is Luther's words. It reminds us and it rings a bell in our hearts and in our minds. The life of a believer must be a life of daily repentance. Never a day pass by that you and I are not saddled with sin. That is why repentance should be a regular pattern or routine of a believer before his God. Is this what we do each day when we draw near to God in prayer, when we seek his presence at the start of the day or in whatever uh, time of the day that you have your communion with your God? This should be a reminder to us. We need to bring our sins before God for cleansing. We have to reflect on our daily life. And the assurance given to us is of God's restoring grace through forgiveness, which God has promised because of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the problem is, for some, is there is no conviction of sin. And people do not have relief from sin. We do not have to offer sacrifices to seek relief from the guilt of our sin. Brethren, grace is available to the believer. And that is why 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us from our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the promise that God has in store for a believer repentance uh, forgiveness is assured when we repent of our sin because of Christ sacrifice on the cross but there are two problems uh, which are posed in uh, beside this verse in verses 8 and 10 which are essential denials before and after the promise verse 8 says if we say we have no sin it is to deny the deny sin as a condition, then you have a problem. In verse 10, it says, If you say you have no sin, you make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is to deny that you have sin. The act itself. And when you are when you are in this situation, you it poses a problem to you. Instead of being blessed by the assurance of forgiveness, you fail to go to God in repentance for your sin and have the cleansing. That is why people do not get the forgiveness and cleansing promised by God and they remain in their sin, guilt, and misery. And that is why the appeal of this pulpit is once again to those who are without Christ. If you are struggling with that guilt because of your condition or perhaps you do not know where you are headed for as a sinner the reminder is your hope rests in Christ's atoning sacrifice in the purification uh, brought about by Christ's blood through his death on the cross 
So the appeal is to draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith for the forgiveness of your sin and the promised eternal life through his death on the cross. In our time and age, we are more blessed because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our waywardness as God's people. But the crucial passage in the whole of the Holy Spirit's convicting work is in John 8, 16, verses 8 to 11, where it says, When He, the Spirit, comes, we will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they did not believe in me concerning righteousness because i go to the father and you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged and this tells us of the unique way where in the holy spirit's work unique in talk in uh, uniqueness of the holy spirit's work in the world and it, we are told in these verses that it is done in three convicting ways. People never experience conviction on their own. They need the Holy Spirit's conviction. They are convicted in their hearts of the unrighteous, of the righteousness they need. And thirdly, they need convincing to the Holy Spirit of the judgment that is theirs if they do not follow if they continue to follow the devil and this is how the holy spirit ministers does his work of, of conviction for a sinner in our time and what and romans 5 20 tells us of the wonderful grace of god where sin increase grace abounded all the more though we continue to struggle with our remaining sin but the grace of god is available for god's people and this is the text of john bunyan's auto uh, that speaks of his autobiography the title of his autobiography is grace abounding to the chief of sinners taken from 1st Timothy 1 verses 13 to 16 and the title of his autobiography is a testimony of what he discovered no matter how great his sin was the grace of God proved itself greater and this should be our, our continuing hope as we navigate life's journey as we continue to deal with our remaining sin we thank and praise God because through Christ's purifying sacrifice, we have the assured forgiveness of God so that we do, not only are we forgiven, but we are cleansed. Guilt is no more, and we can go on serving and honoring God. And in response, let us sing the hymn how shall a contrite spirit pray the first verse tells us how shall a contrite spirit pray a broken heart its grief make known a weary wanderer find the way to peace and rest through christ alone may this be our continuing hope and rest the peace that we have because of the atoning work of christ so that through his death, the assurance of his restoring grace, when we fall into sin, when we stumble because of our ignorance, weakness, or failure, we have the assurance of, Christ, of God's forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us sing, How Shall a Contrite Spirit Pray? Let us close in prayer. Indeed, O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us through your word of the awfulness of our, of our condition with our remaining sin. It is a struggle that we, we continue to fight as we live our lives for you.
But we praise and thank you, O God, for though it is an awful sight to behold, sin is something you hate. For a God who is holy desires for his people to be holy. But we praise and thank you for we have the assurance or the availability of your restoring grace. It is available to every sinner, most especially to a believer, because of the work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Through his perfect, through his death on that cross, wherein he who was perfect became, became the punishment for us through his atoning sacrifice. We have the assurance of forgiveness. And thus, as we sang the hymn, may this be our prayer that we can draw near to you. Seek your mercy because we have a high priest the two intercedes for us as we struggle and navigate our lives dealing with our sin. We are, we are not forever hopeless despite the struggle of sin. For grace is available for us. But may this also be a call for those who are still without Christ. May they be drawn to the mercy's promise through Christ's death on the cross, to their repentance and faith in Him alone. So, Father, we thank you for though we struggle, we have the assurance of your mercy because of Christ's accomplished work on the cross. And may this be a comfort. May this be a continuing hope and help us to live a life of continuing repentance. Father, glorify your name to your church. Grant us the wisdom and the grace that we need. For we, we commit these things to you. In Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen.